Easter in My Heart, Uplifting Stories of Redemption and Hope, compiled and edited by Joe Wheeler, author of Christmas in My Heart. Easter for your heart, new life for your spirit. For nearly a decade, readers around the world have been exhorted, entertained, amazed, and moved by the heartwarming stories found in Dr. Joe Wheeler's Christmas in My Heart series. Now Dr. Wheeler, a scholar of what he calls the Golden Age of Judeo-Christian Stories, 1870s to 1950s, has compiled perhaps the greatest and most moving collection of Easter stories ever published. Your spirit will be blessed and freshly awakened through this collection of inspirational and nostalgic stories that perfectly capture the spirit of Easter, hope realized, faith fulfilled, and life both gloriously and freely redeemed. Joe Wheeler, Ph.D., is considered to be one of the nation's top anthologizers of stories. He is best known for his best-selling Christmas in My Heart series, gold medallion finalist in 1995, and Great Stories Remembered series awarded Family Television's highest award, the Seal of Quality, in 1996. Dr. Wheeler is a is Professor Emeritus of English at Columbia Union College at Tacoma Park, Maryland, Senior Fellow for Cultural Studies at the Center for the New West in Denver, Colorado, and Founder and Executive Director of the Zane Gray's West Society. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees, degrees in history from Pacific Union College, a master's degree in English from Sacramento State University, and a Ph.D. in English from Vanderbilt University. He and his wife, Connie, live in Conifer, Colorado, with Pandora, their, their Himalayan cat. The Wheelers have two grown children, Greg and Michelle. Easter in My Heart, Uplifting Stories of Redemption and Hope, compiled and edited by Joe Wheeler. Published by Waterbrook Press, 5446 North Academy Boulevard, Suite 200, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80918, a division of Random House Incorporated. Unless otherwise indicated, all scripture quotations are taken from the Holy Bible. New Living Translation, copyright 1996. Used by permission of Tyndale House Publishers, Wheaton, Illinois, 60189. All rights reserved. Copyright 2000 by Joe Wheeler. Published in association with the Literary Agency of Alive Communications, Incorporated, 1465 Kelly Johnson Boulevard, Suite 320, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 809. Waterbrook and its Deer Design logo are registered trademarks of Waterbrook Press, a division of Random House Incorporated. This book is being read by Papa George Holt. To Connie Palmer, Palmer Wheeler, for 40 years now, she has remained at my side through good days and bad, joy and sorrow, success and failure. In an unstable world, she has been and remains a certainty, a constant, a wife who signed on for the long haul, the entire journey. In this ministry of stories, she is an equal partner. Thus, this is her book too. Bless her. Table of Contents Introduction Rediscovering Easter Joseph Leninger Wheeler. Chapter 1. What was in Jeremy's egg? Ida May Kempel. 2. The Arbutus Bonnet. Margaret E. Sangster, Jr. Chapter 3. The Maid of Emmaus. Agnes Slay Turnbull. Chapter 4. The Hidden Treasure. Arthur Gordon. Chapter 5. An Easter Song by Grace 
Ethelyn Cody. Chapter 6. Mrs. Pepper Passes. Helen Ward Banks. 7. Only a Piece of Glass. Author Unknown. Chapter 8. Polly's Easter Service by Elizabeth Price. Chapter 9. The Gift. Margaret Prescott Montague. Chapter 10. Pieces of Silver. Clarence Bunny Buddington Kelland. Chapter 11. Lilies for Inspiration. Mabel McKee. Chapter 12. A Glimpse of Heaven. Harriet Loomis Smith. Chapter 13. The Hollow, the Hollow Man. Written by Joseph Leninger Wheeler. Acknowledgements. Introduction. Rediscovering Easter by Joseph Leninger Wheeler. Copyright 1999. Printed by permission of the author. Introduction. If Easter Be Not True by Henry H. Barstow, D.D., if anyone knows of the earliest publication date and publisher of this old poem, please relay that information to Joe Wheeler, Care of Waterbrook Press. What Was in Jeremy's Egg by Ida May Kempel, published in Focus on the Family magazine, April 1988, reprinted by permission of the author. The Arbutus Bonnet by Margaret E. Sangster, Jr., reprinted by permission of Christian Herald Association, New York. The Maid of Emmaus, by Agnes Sly Turnbull, published in Turnbull's Far Above Rubies, Fleming H. Revel Company, 1926, reprinted by permission of Fleming H. Revel, a division of Baker Bookhouse, Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Hidden Treasure, by Arthur Gordon, published in Gordon's The Hidden Treasure, Fleming H. Revel Company, 1974, reprinted by permission of the author. An Easter Song, by Grace Ethelyn Cody, published in The Youth's Companion, April 13, 1911. Mrs. Pepper Passes, by Helen Ward Banks, published in The Youth's Compassion, April 5th, 1917. Only a piece of glass, author unknown. If anyone can provide knowledge of author, earliest, earliest publication and date of this story, please, please relay this information to Joe Wheeler, Care of Water Book Press. Paul, Polly's Easter Service by Elizabeth Price, published in the Youth's Instructor, April 5, 1921, Text reprinted by permission of Review and Herald Publishing Association, Hagerstown, Maryland. The Gift by Margaret Prescott Montague, published in Montague's The Gift, New York, E.P. Dutton, 1919. Pieces of Silver by Clarence Buddington Kellond, published in Harper's Monthly, April 1913. Lilies for Inspiration by, ba by Mabel McKee, published in Young People's Weekly, March 26, 1932, reprinted by permission of David C. Cook, Colorado Springs, Colorado, and Fleming H. Revel, a division of Baker House, Grand Rapids, Michigan. A Glimpse of Heaven by Harriet Loomis Smith, published in Young People's Weekly, March 26, 1932, Text reprinted by permission of David C. Cook, Colorado Springs, Colorado. The Hollow Man by Joseph Leninger Wheeler, copyrighted 1999, permitted, printed by permission of the author. Woodcut illustrations are from the library of Joe Wheeler. Introduction. Rediscovering Easter. Let every man and woman count themselves immortal. Let him catch the revelation of Jesus in his resurrection. Let him say not merely, Christ is risen, but I shall rise. In me there is something that no stain on earth can tarnish, and no stroke of the world can erase. I too am a part of God, and have God's immortality in me. Written by Philip Brooks, 1835-1893. to The Son of God, Co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit was dead. 
nothing comparable had ever occurred in all the billions of whirling universes created by God. Not even Lucifer's war with his creator and expulsion from heaven could compare, for the Trinity had been victorious over the forces of evil in that epic struggle. Now Lucifer had had his way and compelled his minions to slay the Son of God. At that moment, all other actions stopped as angels and created beings in the worlds peered down from their far-flung ramparts at this unbelievable event that had taken place on this pinpoint of a planet called Earth. Would Lucifer triumph over the Trinity after all? Was the Trinity to be reduced to two? Even Christ, knowing the end from the beginning, weakened under the battering of crucifixion week, and he asked his father whether it was really necessary for him to drink the cup of death, as recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 and 42, Mark 14, verses 35 through 36, Luke 22, verse 42. Worst of all, for the first time in all eternity, God the Father withdrew his presence and protecting hand from his Son, for he had not. Christ never could have validated the contract of our salvation by his death. In the pitch black and the pitch darkness of the Father's withdrawal could be heard perhaps the most heartbreaking wail in all history. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As recorded in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and Mark Chapter 15, verse 34. As Christ surrendered his spirit to the Father and died, the earth was shrouded in st stygian darkness. Earthquakes convulsed the earth, and lightning and thunder so blinded and deafened the spectators that thousands feared the world was coming to its end. In the midst of it all, Many of the saints were resurrected. When the darkness finally receded, there they were, walking the streets of Jerusalem. The Roman officers, who had experienced it all, had only one answer for those astounding events. Truly this was the Son of God. Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. In the temple, the great curtains separating the holy from the most holy place was rent by a giant unseen hand from top to bottom, signifying that further sacrifices were, were no longer needed. The ultimate sacrifice had been made so that the human race might once again regain eternal life. But would Christ? The answer came early that Sunday morning. Not all the forces of hell could have kept that great boulder from being rolled aside, nor God the Son from being resurrected. We have become so accustomed to telling the story, to hearing it and reading it, that we forget how different the world would be had Christ failed to rise from the dead. Had Lucifer triumphed, life would be, life would be but a cruel joke. Nothing would have any real meaning or relevance. But Christ did rise, and in so doing made possible the eternal life referred to by Philip Brooks, author of O Little Town of Bethlehem, in our opening quotation, and all this we remember every Easter, or should. The Pauline Legacy If Easter be not true, then all the lilies low must lie. The Flander, Flanders poppies fade and die. The spring must lose her fairest bloom. For Christ were still within the tomb, if Easter be not true. If Easter, if Easter be not true, then faith must mount on broken wing, then hope no more, immortal spring, then hope must lose her mighty urge. Life prove a phantom, death a dirge, if Easter be not true. If Easter be not true, twere foolishness the cross to bear. He died in vain who suffered there. What matter though we laugh or cry? Be good or evil, live or die, if Easter be not true. If Easter be not true, but it is true, and Christ is risen, 
and mortal spirit from its prison of sin and death with him may rise. Worthwhile the struggle, sure the prize, since Easter, A, is true. If Easter be not true, by Henry H. Barstow, D.D. For, for any who yet doubt the truth of the Easter story, all they need to do is to study the life, ministry, philosophy, theology, and writings of one of the greatest minds of all time, Saul of Tarsus. Saul, a Roman citizen, was well educated in Roman, Hellenistic, and Semitic cultures, as well as being considered one of the spiritual giants who studied under the legendary Gamel in Jerusalem. There are remarkable parallels between the Saul into Paul story and that of Martin Luther. Early on, both men were extreme legalists, firmly believing that in salvation by perfect observation of the law, the early lives of both were dominated by their perception of the law as the defining standard of one's relative goodness or wickedness. It was because Saul believed so completely in Jewish law that he was filled with such hatred against the early Christians. He felt it was blasphemous to replace that law with a perceived Messiah. He did more than verbally oppose Christian ideas. As a member of the Sanhedrin and the Jewish high command, he was the chief persecutor of the Palestinian Christians. In fact, he had much to do with the, with the stoning of that first Christian martyr, St Stephen. Stephen, one of the seven deacons, learned in both the Greek and Jewish cultures, was the most eloquent and persuasive of all the early Christian leaders. In his masterful oration of self-defense delivered to the Sanhedrin, Stephen called Moses' prophecies regarding the Messiah and declared Christ to be their fulfillment. He appealed to his listeners to see Christ as having rede redefined the way to eternal life. It was in vain. The Jewish leaders sentenced him to be stoned. Saul could erase neither Stephen's words nor his calm acceptance of death. Nevertheless, he determined to pass on with his bloody sword. On the road to Damascus, came Damascus, Christ came to him in a blinding midday encounter. In the darkness that followed, Saul became Paul, second only to Christ in Christian history and thought. The reality of this meeting with his ascended Lord cannot be questioned. Over time, Paul compared what he had seen, heard, and experienced with the apostles who had interacted personally with Christ during his earthly ministry. Paul found no cracks, no discrepancies. Truly, he had communed with the Son of God. He had little to gain and much to lose by this sudden apostasy from Judaism. To, camp, to contemporaries, his sudden 180-degree turn must have bordered on the inexplicable. Paul saved early Christianity from degenerating into merely another Jewish sect, from spiraling downward into bondage and religious legalism. In Paul's conversion, Jesus the Christ became as central to his new walk as the law had been in his old. In this respect, Paul went far beyond the other early church leaders, for he boldly proclaimed that Christ's death on the cross had changed everything, redefined everything. In fact, Paul declared Christ replaced the law with himself and became the medium of communication between God and man. To Paul, Christ was all in all, everything, and his death and resurrection formed the basis of a totally new way of living, acting, and worship, worshiping. He pointed out that if righteousness resulted merely from observance of the law, then why did Christ have to die? The cross was central to Paul, and the majesty of it permeates his writings to the early church, a church he transformed from a Jewish sect into a worldwide fellowship of believers from all nations and races. He wrote not as theologian, but as a pastor, a prophet, a counselor, a teacher, a mentor, and a missionary seeking to make the miracle of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension real and meaningful 
to each culture. Hence, he addressed each group of believers uniquely. Paul redefined spirituality in moral terms, borrowing heavily from Christ's own words, but also explaining their meaning through the prism of his own human weaknesses and frailties. Eternal life, thanks to Christ's sacrifice, was now a given to all who believed. In union with the Redeemer, each believer was now a son, a daughter of God, and thus saved. Having established that truth, he went on to develop the thesis that the fruits of the Spirit reveal whether one is a true believer or a false one. He would have agreed with C.S. Lewis that belief and works are like the two blades of a pair of scissors, each being essential to the scissors' purpose. Paul so changed the course of Christianity that he became its second founder. H. Winnell maintains that Paul was Jesus' most genuine disciple, the one who best understood and reproduced his thought, unquote. He also reminded believers of Christ's declaration that eternal life was a present rather than a future reality and way of life, and he fully de defined grace for the first time. This life-transforming power of Christ's death and resurrection is the focus of the stories contained herein, as I will explain in more detail momentarily, allowing Easter to transform us. Long ago, the poet Wordsworth issued a warning about letting the world be too much with us. If he could only see us now, children watch TV and computer screens four and a half hours a day, representing 1,600 hours a year as compared to a 1,000 classroom hours. We adults have mistakenly assumed that the computer age would result in increased time for leisure and reflection. Instead, the reverse is true. Surrounded as we are by electronic gadgetry, we can conceivably work every waking hour. Cell phones follow us outside, into the kitchen, bedroom, and bath, into the car, into the restaurant, into the supermarket, and even to the remotest part of the planet. Laptop computers make work omnipresent. Satellite uplinks and pages find us even when we do not wish to be found. As a, re as a result, we are in grave danger of losing both our personal identity and our relationship with God. Gradually, inexorably, the worlds of work and entertainment seek to gain control of our every waking moment, evicting God in the process. For those who feel drained by this incessant squirrel wheel of nonstop action, Easter offers an opportunity to stop and reflect. We all have time for what we value most. When a loved one dies, we, who had no time to write a letter to, or telephone, or occasionally visit that person, suddenly have all the time in the world. We notify our employer that there has been a death in the family, cancel all other commitments, no matter how important, and spend whatever money it takes to travel to the place where services are being held. And while there, we are likely to express, express genuine regret over our failure to better communicate our love to that person while he or she was still with us. It's the same with our soul and our relationship with our Lord. We have as much, or as little, time for Him as we determined. I suggest that as, fa that as Easter week approaches, we each determine to spend it with God, to turn off the cacophony of the world and enter into a week of quiet serenity, contemplation, and study of God's Word, especially as it relates to His great sacrifice on our behalf at the cross. Should we do so, I am convinced our society would be a different place in which to live. In much of the Christian world for almost two millenniums, the standard Easter greeting was, Christ is risen. Today, millions content themselves with colorful Easter clothing, Easter eggs, and Easter parades. The cross and the lamb have been replaced by floats and rabbits. It is long past time for Christians to desecularize 
the holiday. There is nothing inherently wrong with colorful clothes, eggs, and parades. But when these things are perceived as valid substitutes for the spiritual services, traditions, symbolism, and meaning that undergird this holy week, a signal opportunity to commune with our Savior is lost. Paul reminds us again and again of the transformation, transformational power of the gospel found in the miracle of Easter. Easter, falling at the season of rebirth for all living things, is the perfect time for spiritual renewal as well, for giving God the opportunity to step in and transform us into his daughters and sons. Furthermore, Easter should be the most joyful, and thankful day of the year, for it symbolizes our highest, if not ultimate, hope, the promise of life after death. This promise is perhaps best articulated by the Apostle John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 My Own Journey Why is there such a wealth of custom in honor of Christmas and such a dearth in such a dearth in honor of Easter. In the Gospels, the, re the resurrection is described more fully than the incarnation. Then why has later Christian loyalty enshrined the birth of Jesus in many a song and happy custom and left the rising of Jesus almost bereft of rich tradition? There's a matter for reflection. Written by George A. Buttress. Given the undeniable fact that Easter... Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension represents the bedrock upon which Christianity and our lives are built. One would expect evidence of that primacy to be everywhere. Alas, they are not. Permit me to share with you a little of my own journey in this respect. Out of the mists of my childhood I can see, through the camera lens of memory, Easter processions moving down the street not marching bands, floats, shriners, horse troops, clowns, and beauty queens, but rather the reenactment of Christ's suffering in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. In Latin America, where I was privileged to spend half of my growing up years, Easter was not a mere formality or a child's holiday. Rather, it was a spiritual earthquake that would bring the entire city or town to a halt, and the ringing of the cathedral bells so loud they swallowed up all other sounds. They are part of me still. It has been way too long since I was part of such a passion-filled Easter. It is said that Christmas and Easter are the two most significant religious holidays we have, but one would never know that by how we respond to them, at least not to Easter. I would guess I am somewhat typical in this respect. Over the past 50 years, I have become mightily involved with the season of Christmas, but only superficially involved with the season of Easter. In 1989, my life was changed by a co-ed from Columbia Union College who asked me a simple question. Dr. Wheeler, have you ever thought of writing a Christmas story? Because of that question, I wrote one, then another, and another. Because of that question during the intervening years, I have helped to give birth to a dozen Christmas in My Heart books for Review and Herald, Doubleday, Tyndale House, and Focus on the Family. In the process, Christmas ceased to be merely a short season for me and my wife, Connie. Instead, it became a year-round presence as we plowed through thousands of Christmas stories in our search for those precious few that are Christ-centered rather than Santa Claus-centered and that touched the heart. Once in a while, as the years passed, I'd, I'd considered editing a collection of stories having to do with that other great Christian high day, Easter, but I quickly reconsidered when I found that such stories were almost non-existent, much, much rarer than Christmas stories. Then it was, thus it was, that when Dan Rich and his splendid team at Waterbrook asked if I was interested in putting together a collection of Easter stories. I didn't think it was possible, so I temporized, and I tried to get them to accept a watered-down mix of stories having to do with Easter springtime turning points, new beginnings, 
and New Year's themes. Providentially, they held their ground. No, what we want are Easter stories that incorporate spiritual values. I see, I'd see, i see what I could do. First, I checked Christian bookstores. No such animal. Easter stories? Never seen such a book. Ought to be a market for them, though. Time passed, and the deadline for manuscript submissions was fast approaching. I began to get worried, really worried. So I turned it over to the good Lord. Father, I prayed, I believe it is your will that I put together a collection of Easter stories. If that is true, will you please help me? Right after I turned the matter over to him, things began happening. I never ceased to be amazed by God's incredible choreography. A number of years ago, when Christmas in my heart was in its infancy, a friend of mine, the Reverend Dr. Daryl Richardson, called me up and told me he was in town for a convention and had brought me a present. It turned out to be a large box of old, well over half a century old, inspirational magazines, all filled with stories. As the years passed by, I looked into the box once, picked out a Christmas story or two, then forgot about it. Now, on deadline for this Easter collection, I found myself on an apparently dead-end street. There were not nearly enough Christ-centered Easter stories to fill a book. Every morning, I would again ask God for help. If it was really His will that such a collection be put together, would He please help me find such stories? And quickly, one morning, the conviction came. Find that box of old magazines. In due time, I found it and then searched through the entire collection. In the process, I found more great Easter stories than I had encountered in the entire course of my life. How incredible and humbling to realize that years ago God knew the day was coming when those stories would be needed and had them sent to me ahead of time. I no longer believe in coincidence. I have experienced far too many such instances of divine scripting and choreography, but only recently did I find a biblical basis for that assumption as recorded in Psalms 139, verses 1 through 5, and verses 15 to 16, one of the most life-changing passages in all Scripture. Strange, isn't it, that such, a, such an Easter story shortage should exist? Once upon a time, for a very short time, Christian writers wrote Easter stories for inspirational journals. Then son, suddenly, no one wrote anymore. Their inexplicable absence is not unique to the story genre, as I learned while searching for Easter poetry and quotations. Apparently, there is an unspoken assumption that people aren't at all interested in such things. One never-to-be-forgotten day, I, I took stock of what the Lord had brought to me. Lo and behold, it was, as I believe, a powerful a collection of short stories as I've ever been privileged to place between two covers. By now, I clearly realized that he was at work behind the scenes. This was not merely another book. It was a divinely ordained one. Now I belatedly faced another problem. I had never written an Easter story before. Was this going to be the first of my anthologies to, to be published without a story of my own? As the deadline neared again, I asked God, as I had so many times before, that if it were his will for a story of mine to be included, would he please help me bring the right one to mind, to my mind? He did, and he continued to bless and guide my pen during the initial 72-hour gestation period. The result is The Hollow Man. This first collection. So here it is, one of the few such collections of Christ-centered Easter stories to appear in more than a century. Providentially, I was able to find enough stories to give me the luxury of weeding out all but those I perceived as the most moving. As I have found true in other anthologies, I have put together the stories The stories represent a broad approach and sampling of subjects, for there is no one, no one best way to teach values. Most of us today resent overt didactism in stories, preferring to get the message and less lesson indirectly. Thus, I have deliberately chosen stories in which the authors permitted the storylines to carry the freight rather than bludgeon 
readers with conclusions that are already obvious. Some of the greatest names in Judeo-Christian story writing are represented here, a number of them once famous but now sadly oft forgotten within the Christian community. Margaret E. Sangster, Jr., Arthur Gordon, Agnes Sly Turnbull, Mabel McKee, Helen Ward Banks, Margaret Prescott Montaigne, and Harriet Loomis Smith. Most of the others included were once well known to readers of turn of the century Christian magazines. Several are recent and are still writing. I feel confident you will agree that their voices need to be heard again as we enter a new century and, and millennium. In this respect, I view it as providential that I was homeschooled by a remarkable woman, my mother who filled me with the old-timey Judeo-Christian gut-wrenchings, gut-wrenchers, the kind of stories that moves you so deeply that tears are never far away, the kind of story that makes you a better, kinder, more empathetic person as a result of having listened to it or read it, the kind of story that all but died out with the advent of television in the late 40s. I am convinced that God preordained me to this ministry of such stories by giving me over half a century to collect those I loved most before the summons came to start putting the collections together. Even now, we are losing them every year as surviving copies of these wonderful inspirational magazines are hauled out to the dump or they disintegrate or darken because of brittle old age. Saving them ought to be the highest of priorities for a Christian community starved for life-changing stories. For, let's face it, they no longer appear in the textbooks our children and youth read. Apparently, most of today's textbooks, textbook and thought anthologizers are reluctant to include stories that incorporate traditional Judeo-Christian values. The world the textbooks do present, however, is all too often dysfunctional and bordering on the immoral. Thus, if today's parents fail to help their children internalize the right kind of values at home, they should not be surprised to discover that the other kind have been internalized away from home. We do, in a very real sense, grow into our favorite stories, become them. That's why Christ never spoke without using stories. We have an inborn distaste for abstractions, but the stories we love ride a Trojan horse into the very heart of us. The stories we love most, we never forget. Years ago, I learned that great stories refuse to be pigeonholed or classified, for they deal with all of life, not just part of it. Each, con each contributes to fleshing out the reader's philosophy of life, especially if the moralizing is low-key rather than overt. That is why great stories reach us in ways and places the writers would never have guessed. Two of the stories in this collection, The Maid of Emmaus and the Piece of Silver, have settings in Palestine during Easter week and shortly afterward. Such stories are scarce and hard to find. The rest of the stories are Easter in spirit, showing us how Easter can be incorporated into the very fabric of our lives. It might be a story of a handicapped child like Jeremy, whose mind is capable of steering through all the superficialities and froth of Easter to the essence of why we observe it. In the Arbutus Bonnet, we see a preacher's daughter who learned to make do with the little she has, even to the extent of trusting her future to flowers from God's own hands. In The Hidden Treasure, a chance encounter after an Easter sunrise at, at sea causes Arthur Gordon to consider the probability that there is a continuity in life, even in our Easters. Two of the stories, Polly's Easter service and only a piece of glass remind us that although we may consider ourselves of no more use than a dusty piece of glass or an ugly brown bulb, both are essential in the Master's grand plan. Both may flower into breathtaking beauty. Ah, the transforming power of Easter. In 
in an Easter song. It takes an understanding aunt and a woman doomed to lifelong blindness, blindness to show a bereaved young woman the difference she might make during Easter and afterwards. As much older women named Mrs. Peppy also makes a difference one Easter Sunday because she was filled with our Lord's selflessness and empathy. In the gift, a renowned minister finds his own faith dangerously weak one bleak Easter, confounded by the death of his own son. Then along comes a woman who does not profess to believe in God, yet still searches for him and for answers. Both are brought closer to the cross during the encounter. Then we meet yet another preacher's daughter in Lilies for Inspiration, who discovers that most of all, Easter means sacrifice, service for others. In a glimpse of heaven, we learn that everything, be it sorrow, heartbreak, or blindness, has its purpose, that all things make sense when spread out on the tapestry of eternal life, thus providing a new dimension for Easter. In the hollow man, we discover that nothing makes sense without Christ and his Easter sacrifice for us, that giving rather than getting is what life is really about. Coda, it is my prayer and my hope that this book will prove to be both a joy and a blessing to you. If you know of additional Easter stories with the same emotive power as these, I would deeply appreciate your sending me copies with information about authorship date and place of earliest publication, if known. Am I, as I am editing collection of stories in other genres, I welcome stories outside the Easter genre as well. There is no valid reason why the e season of Easter should not again achieve the rank and place it once had among Christian believers. This incredibly rich season of the year, sometimes stretching from January to June, deserves to have its own literature, its own stories. How wonderful it would be if Christian writers would once again begin to write them. If our response from you are positive, we will consider another collection of Easter stories at a later date. I look forward to hearing from you, and may you reach me by writing to me, Joe L. Wheeler, Ph.D., in care of Waterbrook Press, 5446 North Academy, Boulevard Suite 2000, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80918.